what's going on y'all it's cone back here again today with another episode of after the buzzer the show where i recap the nba games from the night and we just had game one of the 2024 nba finals celtics mavericks a series that me and many others think could be one of those classic matchups you've got star power you've got great basketball offensively and defensively on both sides all the storylines and narratives you could possibly want this feels like it's going to be a lengthy series that really could go either way and i kind of expected that going into game one i did predict the celtics to win i thought they were going to come in here and win game one at home but what i didn't expect was for them to all out blitz the dallas mavericks for a 17 point lead at the end of the first quarter which is the biggest first quarter lead in any game one of the nba finals ever so kind of impressive there they were raining threes down on them the stars were showing out in the second quarter they built that lead up to 29 just putting their foot on the neck of the Dallas Mavericks, showing why they've been the most dominant team in basketball the entire year. Now, the Mavericks fought back a little bit in the third quarter. They brought it within single digits, actually. Luka Doncic started going crazy, but then Joe Mazzulla called a timeout, and after that timeout, rather than letting the Mavericks continue to build momentum or letting them hang around, the Celtics immediately stomped out the comeback effort. They went back up by 20. They ended up winning by 18 points. The Mavericks pulled their starters with like five, four minutes to go. It was, for the most part, a dominant wall-to-wall -wall effort on both ends and even with that little blip in the middle the fact that the Celtics weren't really phased by that at all which I feel like is something that would really rattle Celtics teams of the past I think is really indicative of their growth and now this is not the same Celtics team that people know I think a lot of people coming into this series just expect the Celtics to crumble the way they have in the past because oh it's the Boston Celtics this is a ridiculously stacked team you know guys like Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum have really learned from a lot of their experiences Jalen Brown is the best he's ever been was unbelievable in this game went out there there and had a really efficient 22.6 rebounds, two assists, three steals, three blocks. Dominant defensively was a big X factor for them, really shifted the game in their favor. Jason Tatum, not his best shooting night, but he hit a few threes, grabbed some boards, play made, and was, you know, not forcing it too much. I think that was a big plus because there was a lot of pressure towards him. He was taking good shots, wasn't trying to get in the way. He probably should be a little bit better going forward, but hey, this wasn't the worst game for him. Derek White was really cooking. Drew Holiday was great out there. Sam Hauser was hitting shots and locking up defensively like he and Al Horford are theoretically two of the weaker links defensively on this team and they were still holding their own against this Mavericks squad defensively one of the most impressive games I've seen anybody put together against the Mavericks probably the most impressive out of anybody this entire playoff run that the Mavericks have been on the Celtics are loaded and one guy in particular that I don't think has gotten enough credit for the Celtics success this entire season and people were not giving enough credit to be a massive impact in this final series making his return is Kristaps Porzingis for the entire Entire week leading into these finals, I remember so many people talking about, oh, the Celtics had a cakewalk of an Eastern Conference playoffs where every team had some type of player injured, but I feel like nobody ever mentioned that the Celtics didn't have Kristaps Porzingis, who is a all-star level guy, is their anchor on the defensive end, is a stretch big that can do like everything throughout basically the entire run. He played the first few games of the Heat series, ends up having to leave with that calf strain, doesn't play against the Cavs, doesn't play against the Pacers, and yet they still go out there and put up some of the best numbers on both ends. They have the best net rating, and they only lose two games en route to the NBA Finals. Sure, the competition wasn't insane, but it was extremely impressive the way they were still so steady without KP in the lineup, and he made his return in this game, and the reason the Celtics had that blitz going for them in the first quarter was KP, because from the get-go, which he came off the bench, by the way, in the first quarter, so he only ends up playing seven minutes out of the first 12, and he was still the runaway most impactful guy out there with 11 points and a couple of blocks in the overall game. He ends up putting up 20 points, six rebounds, three blocks on 62% shooting, hits a couple of threes, dominant effort. His shot making, the fact that he was just shooting over anybody. They kept switching actions involving Chris Ups for Zingas. They might want to do that less going forward because anytime there's a smaller defender, he was just shooting right up and over them. It looked easy, effortless for him. He was looking like Dirk out there on a lot of those post-ups. He was getting around like Derek Lively just completely ran by him at one point, made him look like he was a traffic cone which is extremely impressive against a great defender like Lively, and I think that's a great sign for KP's health going forward in this series. On the defensive end, altering shots at will, such a game changer for this team. I don't think people realize how much he affects everything the Celtics do. It's not just, you know, losing one guy out of your starting lineup. He is the linchpin for them on both ends with that post-up game. He was the most efficient post score in the league this season. He is an amazing defender, a rim protector, a floor stretcher, and that was all on display in specifically the first quarter, but overall throughout this game. They 
don't dominate the Mavericks the way they did in this game without Kristaps Porzingis. And I just don't feel like the Celtics and he was getting enough credit for what he's done this entire season for them and how much the Celtics missed him throughout the playoffs. And yet they made it look like it didn't even matter. And then you give him a chance here in the biggest game of his career, his first ever time in the NBA Finals. And he was just completely unstoppable. I don't know how the NBA as a whole let the Boston Celtics with this much talent get Kristaps Porzingis. And the trade is a fleece, by the way, like already off the bat, I love Love the Kristaps Porzingis trade for them. I felt like it added a whole new dimension to this team, one that they really needed, giving them another reliable score coming off his best season of his career, probably in Washington last year, with the improved post scoring, his connectiveness as a playmaker, his stretchability, again, that defense that he brings to the table. It just made this team theoretically so much more dynamic. And then they went on top of that and added Drew Holiday to this team. Brad Stevens, somehow a better GM than he was a coach, and it already felt like he was an insane coach when he was with the Celtics. I don't know how he managed to put this thing together, but he did. And the Chris Epps Porzingis trade, assuming the Celtics do go on to win the finals, is going to be looked back on as one of the most stunning transactions of the past couple of years. I still don't understand how he went ahead and made that deal happen. Just kind of conjured it out of thin air. The way that he changed this game was unbelievable. If he continues to have this level of impact, if he continues to torch the Mavericks the way that he did, this is not going to be that long of a series. The Mavericks have to find some way to slow him down. You're probably going to stop letting him get mismatches through those switches and that opens up a whole nother can of worms of trying to guard the Celtics because then you let their guys get downhill kicking out the shooters and they already were dominant in this game from the three-point line shot 38 percent 16 to 42 Celtics actually set a record with seven players that hit two or more threes in this game no team has ever done that in the history of the NBA finals meanwhile for the Mavericks they only had seven threes as a team the Celtics did such a good job of shutting off those corners I can only remember off the top of my head like maybe two or three corner three-point attempts that the Mavericks had in this game which is ridiculous for them because this is a team that thrives in those corners and it just was not an option for them in this game a lot of above the break threes and nobody was really hitting them I mean there was only three Mavericks outside of Luka that hit a three and it was Derek Jones with one one from Jane Hardy and one from Josh Green the defense on the interior was mainly because of Chris Stops and he was unstoppable but then the wings the versatility on the outside from the Celtics as a whole just defending Luka and Kyrie straight up and trusting these elite defenders they have to go ahead and slow them down make them really work even if if they do score, preventing anybody else from getting going. It was a recipe for success, and a lot of that, the linchpin of it all, was Kristaps Porzingis. It was crazy to see him back out there playing in the finals at this high of a level after coming off that injury. No game to go ahead and shake off the rust, just thrown straight into the fire against a red-hot Mavericks team, and he was completely dominant. We'll see if he continues to play up to this level for the rest of the series, but I just don't know how the NBA let this Celtics team that was already really good get a guy of his caliber where now with him being in a winning situation you can see how much he impacts the game at an elite level and he did it on the biggest stage he's ever played on coming off of a calf injury first action and was just unbelievable phenomenal stuff from Chris Ups Porzingis on both ends also got to give a shout to Derek White and Drew Holiday playing great defense all throughout this game 15 from D White 12 from Drew both high level impact players too the Celtics are just an unbelievable team then we get to Dallas, where the bright lights, I think, shook them maybe a little bit. They looked really disjointed at the beginning of the game and all throughout that first and second quarter, found a bit of a rhythm. And again, a lot of that was Luka, who was by far their best player, not even close in this game. 30 points, 10 rebounds, one assist, two steals. Uh, four of 12 shooting from the outside wasn't the most efficient from deep and just 46 as a whole. But a lot of that was because he started to force it a little bit because nobody was hitting anything. They really could not knock down three, seven of 27 from the outside. And his co-star Kyrie Irving was basically basically non-existent. Kyrie finishes with 12 points, three rebounds, two assists, and two steals with three turnovers on six of 19 shooting, 31% from the field, 05 from deep. He was abysmal, and there's a lot of great defensive options on the Celtics team that were making his life really tough, and he had a couple of tough buckets at the beginning. It felt like, okay, this could be a Kyrie game, and then just was non-existent the rest of the night. So it forced Luka to go a little bit into hero ball mode. It made guarding the Mavericks way easier because Kyrie's not out there torching them, so they don't have to throw as much pressure at him. He's got to be a lot better, and I think he's now like 0-11 in his last 11 games against Boston with really bad numbers. He just doesn't seem to perform well against the Celtics, but they need him to. If Kyrie is playing like this, this is probably a sweep or at most a five-game series. Maybe the Mavs pull one out. He has to be worlds better than he was in this game. I assume he will bounce back, but it is a really tough ask, again, against this Celtics team that's full of just these unbelievable defenders left and right. And it's not just him, like Derek Jones, two of nine. The team as a whole wasn't getting any lobs. They were saying, Luka Doncic tried to beat us alone. He couldn't do it. You can't. 
against a team as good as the Celtics. You can't solo them. They need more from their overall supporting guys. Uh, shout out to Jane Hardy, who was good in garbage time with 13 points. But yeah, not a lot to write home about for the Dallas Mavericks. I felt like their defense wasn't bad a lot of the time. The Celtics were just hitting some really tough shots, and the offense was abysmal. Again, this is the biggest defensive challenge, in my opinion, they've had to face, because while Minnesota is technically by the numbers a better defense, the versatility with Boston is way better to match up against this Dallas team and way better to slow them down. They almost feel built to go ahead and stop what the Mavericks do, and I feel like Dallas almost just played it right into their hand in this game. The series definitely isn't over after one game because the Mavs almost always lose game one. It's just been a trend with Jason Kidd at the helm. They found a way to battle back a lot of times. They're gonna have to do so again against the best team they faced. A team that, again, really shut down everything they like to do. No lobs, no corner threes. And the ball movement was just abysmal. They were just saying, hey, try and beat us with iso ball. Like they as a team had nine assists in this entire game. And a couple of those came in garbage time. The Celtics for reference had 23, which was over double the amount of assists. The Mavericks really have to rework this thing. We'll see what Jason Kidd comes up with. But I do think in general, the main thing they need is just for Kyrie Irving to be better. Like if Kyrie was anything close to his usual self, this game is nowhere near the blowout that it ended up turning out to be. And if Kyrie isn't showing up, this is not a very long series. He's really good. So I do expect him to bounce back. We'll see if the Mavericks do as a whole. But for the moment, those are my thoughts on game one of the series. Let me know down below in the comments what your takeaways were, what are your thoughts? Did this change your opinion on how the series is going to go? Or are you holding Pat with your prediction? I appreciate you watching. Leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on future videos. We'll be a game recapping every single finals game that we see here. So you definitely want to be on the lookout for that. As well as some cool content coming in the offseason. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate you watching. I'll see you all later. Real Wednesday back.